Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, it's great to see everybody here this morning, and we always start out by giving a special welcome to anybody who has never been to this meeting before. If you're just joining us at this particular meeting, why, we hope you get something out of it and hope you enjoy it, and we certainly want to welcome you. And if there's anybody here this morning who is new, relatively new to Alcoholics Anonymous, if you have just gotten arrived here in this fellowship, good. We want to welcome you and uh, let you know how much we care, and also to let you know that everybody in this room has been through those feelings that you're having where you just are uh, not sure you're in the right place and a uh, little bit of fear, anxiety. I ought to get out of here before it's too late. And uh, I think these people are too serious about all this not drinking and they don't understand, I'll never make it, or whatever feelings that you're having. Why, all of us had those. And all we can tell you is they're going to go away and your life is going to get a lot better. Uh, there's going to be a lot of wonderful surprises in store for you if you will stick around here. On the other hand, if you go back out, there's nothing but more trouble. Whatever has happened before, it'll get worse. So please go against your better judgment and stay here until a lot, two or three months goes by, and then you'll have a chance to see uh, how this works. It's customary to start our meetings with our preamble, Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We're self-supporting through our own contribution. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And <clears throat> you'll hear that read at just about every meeting that you go to, and it serves as a very good reminder at every meeting to go through this, tells exactly what Alcoholics Anonymous is and what we're doing here this morning, and by last count, at 250 other AA meetings in the Washington, D.C. area every day. That's a lot of groups. And you will find, if you get the directory, the where and when, that there's a meeting near where you work and near where you live. And um, whether you want to go at night or in the morning or noontime, you want a woman's meeting, a men's meeting, a non-smoking meeting, a smoking meeting, whatever, you will be able to have a pretty good choice and that's really a, a luxury living in a big metropolitan area. You get a tremendous choice like that. Um, we have a few announcements to get out of the way. One, we ask you, going once. All right. <laughs> gone. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Or are you wishing them good luck? Okay, if you haven't been here before, why... Um, let me explain, if you're new to AA, this type of meeting is um, a little bit different within our fellowship in that most of our meetings are either speaker meetings or discussion meetings. And this one is a classroom type meeting. We have four or five of these in the Washington, D.C. area, and uh, they were started 25 years ago, somewhere in there. One of them was, anyway, the Steps and Traditions <clears throat> on Tuesday night at the Presbyterian Center. And it was just an idea where you get somebody who's been sober five or ten years, have them follow the literature to the best of their ability, and then go through our steps. And it could be a place where new people or people who've been around a while want to sort of get refreshed on the, on the program to come and sit down and know that uh, it wasn't a discussion thing, so they weren't going to have to sit there and worry about what they were going to say when it was their turn, you know, to talk on the seventh step, and you got to look smart and you're listening to what the other people are saying, but part of you is trying to get your act together about, well, what am I going to say to really sound good here tonight? And so it's um, this way, 
everybody just can sit back and you know ahead of time that we're going to go through the 12 steps here. Now, I think all the other groups go through them three at a time and do the steps once a month. They go one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you finish and start again the next month. Over here, we used to do that, but after about eight years, I think we shifted over <clears throat> to doing them one at a time. <clears throat> and so our format is that we go through the steps one step each Saturday. At the end of the 12 weeks, we have one week on the tradition. <clears throat> then we have two weeks on the history of AA, and then we start all over again. Today, we're on the second step. We just started last week. If you weren't here, we just started the new year out with the first step last week, and then we'll just plow right along, take about three months to get through the whole deal. Um, now, the second step talks about um, coming to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, and that's the thing we'll be focusing on this morning. But very briefly, we always review, uh, for those of you that are new, we get new people here every week, why we focus on the steps and uh, then sort of lead into the second step. The emphasis on the steps is that's what AA is. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous is, are these 12 steps. The 12 steps are what individual members of AA do in order to stay sober and get happy with sobriety. And those two things are absolutely necessary. I mean, that has to happen. You have to get comfortable and happy with your sobriety, or it's going to be almost impossible to stay sober for any extended period of time. That's what going on a wagon was. That's the, Going on the wagon is an attempt to stay sober and miserable at the same time. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody who tried to go on the wagon it was your willpower against all, you know, and it was a huge sacrifice, and it was very difficult, and that's why that particular program doesn't work, On the Wagon Anonymous, um, just <laughs> because they don't have any steps. You know, all you do is don't drink and grin and bear it, and it's just it's too much, and you just collapse, and it's hard. So the steps are designed to enable us both to not drink and be happy with not drinking. And so if you've been in AA a while and you're not reasonably happy, you're doing it wrong. You're just not following the directions. And that's why we go back and review all these steps week after week. So this is what individual members are doing. Now that we have the meetings and we have sponsors and we have all these other activities in Alcoholics Anonymous, but all of that is just designed to force each one of us to continue working the steps. That's what the whole point of AA is, is to get us back to the steps. The steps are the answer. It's the solution. And very often our brain, as you go along in life, I don't care how long you've been sober, your brain will tell you, no, something else is the answer. The answer to my problems is that blonde back there. You know what I'm saying? The answer to that, my problems, is going to Hawaii and getting the hell out of here. The answer to my problem is a BMW. That's the answer to my problem. And we have to keep coming here going, wrong again. The answer is contained in these 12 steps. And we have to keep reminding and go back because this is the, the solution. And so... We talk about the 12 steps as a game plan for living. And the purpose of this game plan for living is to replace your plan for living. That's the main thing that happens in the beginning. We get rid of your plan. As soon as we get rid of your plan, you shoot ahead about eight miles. Because we as alcoholics have come up with a very bad plan for living. Now, it may sound good. I'm sure your philosophy of life sounds good. It's just nobody wants to listen to your plan because you're wearing a wristband. You know. And it's just it's just hard to get anybody's attention. Hey, you wanna know about my way of life? No. We don't want to know about your way of life. It doesn't look like it works. I know it sounds like it works because you're real smart. 
whether you're street smart or college smart, all of us think we're smart when we get here. We're smarter about ourselves than anyone else in the world. And what AA does, and what we're doing, by switching over to a different plan, the biggest thing that happens is we stop doing what we've been doing all our lives that got us here. And so that is one of the great advantages of trying these 12 steps, is that we abandon our old way of living and thinking. Uh, the second thing is you get to look at the results of the 12 steps. That's what AA, if you think about it, in a way, AA is like a great big show and tell operation. We have speaker meetings every night, and we say, oh, tonight we're going to hear from a young lady who's about 30 years old. She has three years sobriety. Here is Mary. And then Mary gets up, and you get to look at three years sobriety. You get to hear the story. I used to be this, locked up in here, and all that. And now I am what you see right here. And this is what's going on with me. So you get to look at the results of the 12 steps all the time. You got a sponsor, you got his friends or her friends, you got discussion meetings, and you're hearing things and you're watching people and you're looking real close and you are seeing the results of the 12 steps. And that's why we say in chapter 5, if you want what we have, this is how you get there. This is the steps that you follow that will take you to this type of sobriety. And you'll notice in AA we don't talk about um, if you work the steps, then you'll be like me. You'll have a Cadillac. You'll have an airplane. You'll have this. You'll have a job. You'll have... That isn't what we're talking about. We start talking about different things that you will have. You will have peace of mind. You will have self-respect. You will have friends. You will feel like you belong in society. You will feel a part of something. You will, And all of these things that we talk about are different measures of success than we used to have. And uh, that is a very important difference. And so this is what Alcoholics Anonymous is. It is this wonderful plan for changing our lives and producing the results that you see in the other people at the meeting. And you, you see it and you know, you recognize it. And you suddenly realize nobody's here conning you and there's no scam going on. There's no angle to be shot. It's just one other drunk trying to show this drunk how to get out of the hellhole that he used to be in. And that's the end of the game. And it's done out of the sheer joy of passing on this message to the next person because when it works for you, it reinforces my faith that this really is true what's happening here. And so that is what I think AA is. And we talked last week about our first step, which I talk about every week leading into any other step because it's the doorway into the program, and that's admitting you're powerless over alcohol, that your life became unmanageable. And we focus on the word powerless because that is, that sets the stage for a spiritual program. That's what this is. It's a spiritual answer rather than an intellectual answer. And we're all used to intellectual answers when we come here, and intellectually you want to figure things out. That's how you do it. You figure it out, and then you think up an answer, and that's what you try to do with your alcohol. And we come in here, and we go, that's the old way, and that doesn't work. Nobody has been able to think their way out of alcoholism ever. Knowledge doesn't help. It doesn't help, because your problem is not ignorance about alcohol. We can teach you all about alcohol, and when you are the world's leading expert on alcohol and alcoholism, if you're an alcoholic, you will be a drunk expert. People will come to listen to what you have to say. They may have to wait till you sober up. But it will not help you to stay sober, because that is not the problem of alcoholism. Our first step tells us what the problem is. We're powerless over alcohol. So learning doesn't make you powerful. Learning doesn't change anything. You just have a smart drunk. And so we have to understand that. If powerless, if you understand the first step, when I say I'm powerless over alcohol, what you have said, whether you realize it or not, is I have a situation where I need a higher power. That's what powerless means. It means 
I, on my own, can never stay sober by myself. I cannot ever stay sober. And we say your power is over alcohol, we mean when you're sober. It's not the fact that when you drink you get all screwed up. That's, that's an easy problem. The real problem is when you're stone cold sober and you know if you take one drink you're going to get all screwed up, guess what you do? You take the drink. You go, well, I'm going to be all screwed up. And down it goes because there's no way to not take it. Something inside of us always causes us to go back. Well, maybe this time nothing or bad will happen. Maybe it'll be different if we're back in to have the beer and then it's off to the races. So when we say we're powerless, we mean that when you are in perfect control of yourself, when you're healthy, you're back in the big bed, you have a job, you got money, and you're, you know, you're just feeling perfect, there's no way that you cannot take the first drink. That's what we're saying. And if you don't believe that, you've got to go back over your own life and finally acknowledge that until you die, you will keep going back to that first drink. That's what being powerless is. And as you go back to the first drink, all the rest of the bad things as the disease progresses will happen and you will have a very bad ending. And that's what alcoholism is. It is absolute inability to avoid taking the first drink. And it's, it drives the rest of the world crazy. It drives our family crazy. It drives us crazy. It's just so frustrating to see a person who understands exactly what the situation is and goes out and drinks anyway. And we promise and we do all these things. So being powerless, but it's a one, it's good news because when we say we're powerless, it ends the discussion. That's it. You're not semi-powerless, you're powerless. And if we're powerless, then we need to find something to deal with being powerless. And that's what the first step does. It is surrender 100%. And if we don't do it 100%, the rest of the program won't work. It's the only step we do 100%. And I, we've known people, and I spoke to I was a little bit that way. You've been around here four or five years, and the program isn't quite working right. And you know why? Because we never really surrendered in the beginning. We held reservations in the back of our heads. Well, I'm 98% powerless. But maybe they'll come up with some kind of a cure. And maybe they'll invent a vitamin that you'll be able to take. And then I'll be able to drink safely, whatever that means. Drinking safely. You know what I... They talk about, would you take a pill if they invented a pill so you could drink socially? Not me. Why would I want to drink socially? I mean, social drinkers, they drink one drink and go to bed. I mean, would, would you pay good money for a pill that would let you take one drink and go to bed? You're not the kind of alcoholic I am. I would only take one of these pills if you could get shit-faced every day and, and nothing bad would happen. And everybody would still love you. <laughs> All right, okay, I'll get it. I don't think they're going to invent one of those. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> this powerlessness is such a wonderful word <clears throat> because it's, it's spirituality without recognizing it. When we say we're powerless, we really are stripped of any way of solving this thing and we must totally rely on something else. <clears throat> and in the beginning, this something else may be your sponsor. I'm, you know, I'm in a point where I'm totally relying on this person who calls me up and tells me what meeting we're going to and what chapter to read and what this to do and what that. That is, that is a spiritual attitude. That is saying, of myself, I'm nothing, I must rely on something else. And that is the beginning of spirituality. That's how you get it. So that's why that is the doorway in, the surrender, the absolute saying, that's it. Now, when you surrender and you're, you, you've sort of turned your life over to AA or your sponsor in the beginning, 
You don't give up control of everything. You still are in charge of a very important part of this. Your job is to judge the results. That's your job. And you, you say, go ahead. I'm going to follow the instructions that you folks have. But I'm going to sit back and give you reports from time to time on how it's working. And that's your big job in the beginning, is to compare the results that you're getting by following directions with the results you were getting when you figured everything out yourself. And most of us report amazing results, much to our surprise. I heard spirituality explained as well as I've ever heard it explained by one teenage girl explaining to a younger teenage girl spirituality. He turned to her, and with the most sincere look you can get, with peer pressure, she just went, this shit works. That was the... (laughs) Because... So many of us are skeptical when we arrive, and that's exactly what the second step is all about. The second step, having surrendered, having caused us to absolutely admit defeat, look what they throw in our face while we're lying on the ground. Now you're going to come to believe that a power greater than yourself can restore you to sanity. All of a sudden, they've brought God into the picture. They've tried to disguise it with a power greater than yourself. But we know what they're talking about. And as soon as they bring that in, now we're going, now we got a problem. Now we got a problem. And the problem is described by Bill in the second step. And the problem is that you have just started a great debate with almost everyone who arrives here. Oh, higher power? Oh, that God stuff? Well, let me tell you where I'm coming from on that. We have a problem, sponsor. I'm not going to be able to just buy into that because, and then you explain who you are and where you're coming from on this higher power stuff. <clears throat> and um, and the debate begins. And in the past, whenever someone has brought this up, you have <clears throat> been very good at winning the debate. Well, let me tell you where I'm coming from on this higher power spirituality stuff. The way I see it, and then the bullshit starts. The way I see it is uh, religion has caused more damage in this world than anything else. That's kind of where I'm coming from. You know what I mean? And, and you just have all this wonderful stuff of where you're coming from. And uh, so, therefore, uh, I don't think I'll be able to go along with this. Well, you're going to find that when you try to debate this issue in Alcoholics Anonymous, you keep losing. You lose to everyone. I mean, you lose to people who never went to grammar school, and you lose to old people, and you lose to young people, and you lose to Westerners. I mean, it's it's amazing some of the things that happen. So why do you lose? I'll tell you why you lose. Because they won't discuss theory. They just discuss results. And they go, oh, you're not going to be able to buy into the program? You're not going to be able to? Too bad. You're going to die. Next. You you, you want to buy in? Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. Let's let's, let's keep the discussion going a little further here, you know. Normally, when I start my line of crap about spirituality and philosophy, somebody else tries to counter it with several logical moves and this and that. I'm not used to just having results thrown in my face like that. But that's all AA do. It's incredibly practical. And they just dump this on us. And so we come up against this problem that is confronting us in the second step. And after you go through the second step, if you're typical, you're going to find that you do a lot of laughing at yourself afterwards. But as you're going through this incredible intellectual debate, you find it very, very challenging and painful. Um, What's involved in order to accomplish the second step is something that is beyond the grasp of many of us. It is called changing your mind. Changing your mind. I remember the first time I heard that, I well, if you're right, why would you change your mind? I mean, that was sort of where I was coming from. I 
never recalled ever changing my mind before. And I could understand how other stupid people would change their mind. And as a matter of fact, that's what I tried to do a lot, was to get other people to see things my way. And so, you know, but here they're talking about changing your mind. And that's really what the second step is all about, is the, the great debate that is going to rage within you over this higher power issue, and then eventually changing our mind. And Bill writes about this in a very humorous way at the beginning of the 12 and 12. I mean, in the, in the big book. There's a chapter in the big book called We Agnostic. It's the chapter of the agnostics. And I remember reading that or seeing it when my sponsor gave me a big book, and I knew what was in that chapter without reading it. Some people know that. I had, you know, a lot of them just, oh yeah, I know what's in there. You can, <clears throat> you can tell from the title, We Agnostics, that that's the chapter that shows agnostics how to stay sober. As opposed to buying into all this God stuff over here in chapter 5. And uh, when you read the chapter, you can summarize the chapter of the agnostic in three words, and it's change your mind. That is what the chapter of the agnostic is. Become a former agnostic. That is the basic um, message in the chapter of the agnostic. And Bill writes a very funny thing in there, and I think that this is what happens when we come to this crossroads. We've met, we're met with powers over alcohol, and now we come to a crossroads in the road here, and step two is sort of explains it to us. And I always like to give the analogy of Jack Benny. I love to tell the Jack Benny story when I get to chapter uh, step two, and the Jack Benny, the great humorist, and back in the radio days, he just had this great radio show, and he was known as a person who could not part with a penny. I mean, he had the first nickel he ever made. He even had a little safe in his house, and he had a pay phone in his house for guests. And when they came, you know, they wouldn't use his phone. And so, this one radio show, he's walking down the hallway, and you just hear the footsteps, click, 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 and then you hear this pickup man's voice goes, Stick him up. And Benny goes, yeah. and the stick up man says, your money or your life. And then the silence starts. And it's five seconds. And it's ten seconds. And you can hear the studio audience starting to laugh. And twenty seconds have gone. There's nothing. There's just been dead silence. And finally the stick up man can't take it anymore. And he says, well, and Benny said, I'm thinking. <laughs> and he was caught on a dilemma. And to some of the outside watchers of this, it's kind of a humorous dilemma. Your money or your life, there's the money. But he's struggling there with this huge dilemma. Well, we can see these dilemmas maybe in an alcoholic's life. We take an alcoholic, young man, he's been uh, from a small town, not a big troublemaker, but he gets drunk a lot, and he gets drunk in public, and and he goes up in front of the judge, and the judge gives him lectures and so on down. But as time goes on, as the judge releases him back in the community, the people are starting to go, this kid is always causing trouble. So they start leaning on the judge. And they're going, look, you can't just keep putting this drunk back on the street. You've got to do something. So finally, with all this pressure, the next time the young man's in there, the judge says to him, I'm sorry, he's been drunk in public 15 times in the last three months. And I'm going to have to do something. So here it is. And half the town is in the courtroom to see what they're going to do to this young man. And the judge said, here's the deal. It's either a year in jail or a one AA meeting. Your choice. Damned if we don't have the Jack Benny syndrome again. <laughs> Five seconds of silence. Ten seconds of silence. Twenty seconds of silence. And all the people are just going, what's the wrong with that kid? He's standing up there, one year in jail or one AA meeting. You know, why is he? Well, in order to get inside his head, we have to get inside his head to see why this dilemma is causing this tremendous crossroad. Now, he's a bar drinker. He drank with his friends down in the bar. And over the years, some of the people would get in so much trouble from drinking that they would go to jail. And once in a while, some of the people that were in the bar would get so bad that they went to AA. And he watched all this very closely. And he made one observation. The people that went to jail 
came back. <laughs> and the people that went to AA, he never saw again in the bar. So one AA meeting meant gone forever in his mind. And so he had this huge dilemma of one, you know, and, and he just struggled with it. Well, and it's funny, you know, because you, we're sort of back here and we know what AA is and we know what a good deal it would be for him. And we just laugh at him trying to make this choice between a year in jail and one AA meeting. Well, in the, Big book in the chapter of the agnostic, we have a similar crossroads that you and I all come up against when we're new in AA. We jump. Here's the crossroads. You come up, and there's one road going this way, and one road going that way. And what it says in the in the chapter is to live on a spiritual basis or to die an alcoholic death are not always easy alternatives to face. So we've come up against. Two doors or two roads. This is where you are at the second step. You have two choices. Up to you. Go ahead and make a choice. One, live on a spiritual basis. Two, die an alcoholic death. And guess what? Long period of silence. Spiritual basis. Hmm. Alcoholic death. Hmm. Call up our doctor. Uh, doctor? Yeah. Hey, listen. I was just trying to settle an argument with a friend of mine. How bad is an alcoholic death? <laughs> really bad. Damn. Spiritual basis or alcoholic death? Wow. Is there a third door that, that we might try? Can you imagine? But this is where we are in the second step. Live on a spirit. Now, why is that? Because we have said living on a spiritual basis is going to be awful. And that's what I said. I, I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what it was. But I knew that I didn't want to choose it. You know what I'm talking about? And so here it was. Coming to believe. It, the thing that was blocking me from making any progress here was changing my mind. I just couldn't change my mind about something very fundamental. It took me years to figure out what it was I was resisting changing my mind about. And I'll tell you what I was like. This is where the, what really happened with me. I want you to imagine that it's back in the uh, 1400s. And you're in Europe. And you have finally made it as a businessman. You are an entrepreneur over there. And you have just cornered the entire European market on maps. Every map that is sold in Europe is distributed by you. And you have warehouses and are ready to start raking in the dough and living the good life. And some clown named Columbus <laughs> has just returned with a preposterous story that the world is round. Now, it doesn't matter that the world may be round. It's just not convenient that it be round at this moment. Because <laughs> if everybody buys into his story that it is round, your inventory is worthless. You see what I'm saying? It's just totally destroyed. And, you know, something very similar happens when we say that we're going to turn our life, come to believe in a higher power. It's like our entire inventory of thinking about what the world is, how you live, is worthless. And you know why? Because we are very self-centered people. And that's part of the disease of alcoholism, is to be self-centered. And our center, being ourselves, causes, uh, caused us to draw a map of the world that we live in with us at the center. And now we're being suggested that that is totally erroneous and that a higher power is really at the center of everything. And if that's true, 
we're going to have to change more damn things than you can imagine. The implications of this step are just too much. And so we try to wiggle out of it. And we try to come up with all kinds of, well, I think man can get along intellectually. We have all the different types that Bill mentions in the 12 and 12, the intellectually self-sufficient. The people are disgusted with religion, and a person who had faith and then lost it, and then we come up with whatever reason that it is that we're not going to be able to follow this. And each one of them, Bill just deals with as he talks about the reality of our situation. What we have, see, all human beings are confronted with this, I think, as they go through life. Bill writes, it's a very interesting thing that he writes, here in the big book, I may have to use my glasses to read this. But I think it's very helpful in understanding the dilemma that we're in. If a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered a long time ago. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us no matter how much we tried. We could not wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these things with all our might, but the needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed us utterly. And so it was very frustrating to try and have values and never be able to live up to them. And I know a lot of people that arrive here have that sense that I am a, a good person and I'm trying, I have values and God damn it, if I just live by them, if I just stuck with them, I could do it and I could be all right. We all wanted to be that and we just kept failing and we just kept failing. You know why we failed? We were trying to live spiritually without a higher power. I was trying to be a moral person on my own and we find out that what our problem was, was lack of power. And this is where we change our perspective on this whole thing. In order to be a better person, we need to rely on a power to be a better person. And that was where we were wrong. Our egos wanted us to say, and all of us were self-centered, ego-driven. And I didn't realize I had said this, because I never really said it in so many words, I said, other people need God in order to be spiritual. I can do it alone. I mean, is that the height of ecocentrism? <laughs> Weak wimps need God in order to get out of this mess that they're in. But real, strong, willpower mm. type people can do it themselves. And this is a joke. I mean, this is an absolute joke. It's just impossible. And so this again became part of the, of the dilemma of the second step. This wonderful idea that somehow I could make it on my own. And that's why we have sponsors. And that's why we have the, the great ego deflation here in the program. And people come up and poke us in the chest. and just They're trying to get us to stop trying to do it by yourself. As soon as we're willing, and all it takes you don't have to understand. You see, AA, I know a lot of us when we're new, and this will be the last point, and then we'll wrap it up. We think that once we agree to the second step, once we have an open mind about the second step, then AA is going to come in and explain uh, this religion to us. And it turns out that's not going to happen at all. That there is no alcoholic anonymous God. There, there is no God to be explained here. All the 12 steps are, are very valuable principles which, if followed, will lead you to a source of power that will make your life wonderful, and it will be up to you to explain what that power is. AA does not prove the existence of God. We specialize in convincing you of the need for a higher power. And the need is you're an alcoholic. And that's where we have the edge over other people who could, who are frustrated by life, <clears throat> wondering why there's no meaning and why they don't fit in. And we're all self-centered as human beings. And at some point, 
we suffer some sort of a situation that causes us to change our perspective and to try and become higher power centered, and then everything fits in, because this is how it really is. A map of the universe with the Earth at the center started driving astronomers nuts because they started looking at stuff and it wasn't moving as if the Earth was the center, and eventually they had to change and found out the sun is what everything went around. And then they said, oh, that's why that moves. And, oh, yeah, well, now it makes sense. And as soon as we shift from being self-centered, where you are the center of the universe, and move over to a higher power center, then everything, oh, yeah, well, that's why that's here. And that's, uh, everything looks different and because we're seeing it the way it really is. And so this shift, oh, the point I was making is, Everyone is confronted with this, but the alcoholics have the edge. This is the gift that I think the alcoholics have. We either try this new way or die. You know what I'm saying? Alcohol is waiting out there. We talk about this if you're new. Maybe you don't know this, but around every AA meeting, around like just outside the building here at NIH, in the grass where the grass is about this high, are hundreds of thousands of half pints of vodka, and they just go down, go down below the level of the grass, and they just circle outside the meeting, and they wait for somebody to come out and say, "The hell with this AA, I'm out of here." And then they jump up. One of them jumps up, and you wave, and you go, "God damn, half pint of vodka just sitting there. Must be God's will." <laughs> And then, you see, what is the problem that's going on right now? We have a person who's not interested in trying AA. So he's about to get interested. You see how you get interested? Vodka gets you interested. Oh, you don't want to try the spiritual thing? Well, come on over here. And then you pour it down, and then alcohol beats the crap out of you. Wham, wham. You ready yet? No, not ready. So, so how do you get ready to become spiritual? Drinking. And puking and going to jail and all of that. Whereas non-alcoholics don't have that strong man standing out there to drive them back into this path. And so in a bizarre fashion, we're the lucky ones who are driven back to this wonderful road <laughs> and not let, we don't have the choice of just aimlessly wandering. We, we don't aimlessly wander. No, you don't find alcoholics aimless. We're out here getting in deep trouble. You know, we don't, we're not aimlessly wandering. If, if that would be a terrible sentence, we're either home as we start drinking again, or we're here. And then we stay here because we don't want to go back out there and get the beat up by the vodka anymore. And then we start down this road, and then wonderful things happen, and then you take credit for it. I mean, that's just... You know. <laughs> then I decided to become spiritual, and life's been wonderful ever since. And we, <clears throat> and we leave out the part about the vodka bottles patrolling the area threatening to beat the crap out of me if I didn't become spiritual. So you can see the, the wonderful irony of how we get down this road uh, that the second step is, is clearly one of the great things. Coming to believe it's the great debate, changing our intellectual position on a higher power to accept the reality of the situation that we're in. Each person struggles to go through it. And if you're like the rest of us, when you finish the struggle, I think that's the decision come over here, you're going to laugh at yourself. I can't believe I stood there at that goddamn door. Let's see. Alcoholic death or spiritual basis? <sighs> I hope nobody saw me standing there. <laughs> We're at the end of the time. We've got a great way to wrap this thing up with the Lord's Prayer for anybody who would care to join in. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.